Hi guys, this is Unraveling System, first introduction video on financial investments within the degrowth narrative. So, degrowth, big umbrella labels, but what we can say is that there is a general critique towards our society nowadays based on too high paces of production and consumption and relying too heavily on non-renewable energy sources. On the other hand, there is a bright vision inside, which is based on five pillars. The first one is well-being for all, according to the conviviality principle. The second one is lowering our production and our consumption rates and also stop imposing our development paces on the global south. The third one is very democratic decision-making processes at the lowest possible level. Then we have local, connected and open economies to be put in place. Hey, but what about the environment? Well, when it comes to the environment, we have the fifth pillar, which is a profound social change starting from the individual or the community according to the principle of sufficiency. The idea is that if we restructure our consumption side, eventually we're going to also have a change in the production patterns in our society and having to consume less and produce less, we're going to have also a lower pressure on our environment. On the other hand, it's also recommendable, more than recommendable, this is an imperative, to switch from non-renewable energy sources towards renewable ones. And once we have like a lower consumption rate, the pressure on the renewables is going to be lower and then we have time to recover. The states are also called for to put important policy incentives in place in order to foster the communities. But when it comes to these, she's much better than I am. So what are the instruments? I know a few financial incentives that are being used right now to foster this development. So the first one is feed-in tariffs. So if you're a renewable energy producer, you sign a contract with the government which gives you access to the electricity grid and also a fixed price for purchasing this renewable energy. The second one is tax exemption. When you produce renewable energy, you receive tax credits in return and you can use that to lower your overall tax to the government. That sounds awesome. Yeah. And the third one is renewable portfolio standards. So the government wants some companies to hold a specific share of renewable energy and as a company, if you produce more or you use more renewable energy than that, you can issue certificates and sell them on a market to companies that don't comply with this share. Wait though, since I'm advocating for the degrowth side, how could a community in general pick up these instruments offered by the state in order like, to achieve actually this transition? Well, some, company, uh, some countries sorry, definitely offer some space for this through energy cooperatives, are autonomous, democratically controlled businesses on a community level where people in the community want to take hold of their own energy production. And for example, in the UK, you can see that they can definitely apply for a feed-in tariff scheme. And in our following video, we'll talk to our expert about more of these energy cooperatives in different parts of the world. Well, we have talked fairly enough about energy, but since the markets use the language of goods and services. Which kind of good would energy be? Well, if you look at the non-renewable resources, I'd say it's a common good, right? Like oil and coal. Yeah, Pfft. okay. But since our degrowth friends have just told us that we want to have an energy transition, what about sun and wind? Sun and wind are public goods, right? I can mm -hmm. have a solar panel, I can use the sun's energy, it doesn't exclude you, and if I use more, you don't get to use less. Well, it sounds awesome. Too bad that in the last decades we have underwent a massive privatization of such goods. And why are you so negative about it? Pfft. Well, keeping in mind what our degrowth guys have said, like Global North imposing certain development patterns to the Global South, like, I could explain why I'm so negative about it, taking the example of highly indebted developing countries. But what happens is that the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank go to these developing countries and say, okay, we're going to delay, delay your debt if you restructure your economy in a healthy way, which usually encompasses the privatization, so the selling off of the state-owned assets. I was reading the other day about a good case study, which is Zambia. You know something about Zambia? <laughs> so it's a fairly big country in the sub-Saharan Africa and they are 
unimaginably rich in mineral resources. 80% of their GDP is based on copper mining, for okay. instance. And what happened is that they accepted this deal of the IMF and the World Bank. And in the 90s, they sold out completely the state-owned assets, so these copper mines, and that went to foreign investors. The problem is that they had two detrimental consequences. The first is environmental, because these companies were not complying with the environmental regulations. Okay. The, the state was like kind of closing an eye on that because they wanted to keep the investors on the ground. So there are cases of dumping of wastewater in the rivers or sulfur dioxide in the air yeah. with damage for the environment and for the health of the local communities. Right. And then a social issue rising because these local people working in the mines are extremely low paid and have poor labor conditions. Wow, okay, so what you basically have is a common good like copper it becomes privatized by foreign investors and this has like an indirect effect on public goods such as water and air quality. And the problem is that they are just enjoyed, I mean, these environmental damages by the local communities, not by the private investors. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's investments, right? Foreign investment. But let's take a step back and analyze this overall framework, framework of investment. Okay. You have two basic financial instruments, okay. stocks and bonds. Let's start with stocks. So stocks works very simply. If you are an investor and you buy a stock, you become a shareholder of a company. You partly own the company. And there's two ways that this can benefit you. The first is that you get part of their annual revenue. This is called a dividend. And the second way is that you decide to buy a stock today. You expect the company you invested in to grow within the next years. And then you sell your stock at a higher price because it has raised in its value. Sounds like speculation to me. Yeah, so <laughs> this growing is really part of the financial instrument. And what about the link with the ecosystems? Aha, good point. That's where I think it comes in handy to explain bonds. So let's look at this very simple hypothetical animation explaining bonds and its effect on ecosystems. Let's check it out. Let's imagine a company extracting lithium, a precious metal naturally occurring on Earth, in seawater and in the lithosphere. It's also largely used in the industry. Lithium is used to produce many useful things, like batteries for phones, cameras, and watches. The company sees an opportunity to make a profitable business. But to operate, it needs money, a capital. But how to get it? The firm needs $100,000. In order to get them, it issues 1,000 bonds, each worth $100. Investors buy such bonds, becoming creditors of the firm. Bonds are a fundamental financial instrument, a form of loan under which the issuer owes the holders a debt and is obliged to pay interest and or to repay the principal at a later date, the so-called maturity date. Each year since the bonds were issued, the company will pay an interest of 5%, so $5 in our case, to the bonds holders until the maturity date. But in 2026, after 10 years, bonds will reach their maturity date and the company will have to pay back the nominal amount of the bonds it issued initially. In our case, that's $100 times 1,000, which is $100,000, corresponding to the initial loan. But wait a second, there is a problem. The figures don't add up. In 2016, when the firm issued the bonds, it received $100,000 by the investors who bought them. By 2026, the company will have paid $50,000 of interest over 10 years, plus the nominal amount paid back on the maturity date of the bonds. This means that it's $150,000 altogether. As you can see, the element of growth is embedded also within this financial instrument. It means the company has to increase its monetary value in order to meet the requirements of the payback, which is higher than the amount it got at the beginning issuing the bonds. Well, one possible way out is to grow, extracting more lithium, and the more it will exploit the mineral vein, the higher the environmental impact on the ecosystem. The higher the rate of extraction, the bigger the company will become. 
but at the expenses of the environment and the local communities of plants, animals and human beings. Growth will come at a high environmental cost. The bottom line? Growth is embedded in financial instruments and it may adversely affect ecosystems, depending on the strategy chosen by the company. Wow, now I got it. So guys, I think we're done. This was our first introductory video. And don't forget, if you want to read more on the concepts we use, check out our WordPress blog. Also, in our next video, we'll interview Fabian Scheidler from Context TV. So thank you for watching. Ciao! Ciao. Thank <laughs> you.